Hello, BookTube. I went back to the Brattle Bookshop first thing this morning, even though I tend to stay away from the shop on the weekends. The weekends, tend it tends to crowd up with people. Uh, whereas first thing in the morning, which is usually when my errands drop me off there these days, uh, or during the week, that is not the case. It's not crowded with people. So I get a chance to schmooze and talk with the staff without thinking that I'm drawing them away from their duties. Uh, although, since I don't really care if I'm drawing them away, I'm perfectly willing to waste their time and the time of the customers. Perfectly willing to talk with the customers as well. Uh, but I, I tend not to go, but I had an overriding reason to go this morning. I was meeting in person with another booktuber for the very first time. Uh, his name is Mark, but he's not the creaky old fossil that we dug up in the ruins of Troy that I usually hang out with whose name is Mark. His, his, YouTube, his booktube channel is Dronzo. Some of you may know of his channel. He doesn't upload videos as often as I do, but then who does? <laughs> but his latest video, over an hour long, on Herodotus. A breakdown of Herodotus. Who he is, how he's, how he's thought about, what he wrote about, how he wrote about it. But it's just about the best hour-long introduction to Herodotus that you're going to get from somebody who doesn't know Greek, or even somebody who does. When I mention a, a complex author like that, an ancient author who may seem intimidating to you, I often say, well, you know, take the Steve approach first. Ground yourself in the basics before you dive into the book. Go to Wikipedia, read uh, Encyclopedia Britannica online, something like that. Read a guidebook or the, a long introduction if you've got a really good one, so that you don't feel like you're coming in cold. Well, now, when it comes to Herodotus, I have something else to recommend. You can just watch his video. Mar watch Mark's video on Herodotus. Wonderful stuff. I'll try to remember to leave a link to it uh, down below. It's an hour long, so it's, a, it's an investment of time, but you'll appreciate it. I feel certain that you will. And he has been to the Brattle a couple of times. I think he heard about it from my channel. Uh, but, of course, if you're within striking distance of the Brattle, you're within striking distance of me. <laughs> so we arranged to meet, and he very kindly agreed to be there first thing in the morning. Oh, I was hoping, I, that was my insistence, I'm sure he would have gone at any time, but I, I, I wanted to do that to sort of beat the crowds. It turns out we didn't beat the crowds. Uh, but it was fun to meet him. I, I was, we were at a set time, we were going to meet there, and I was late, because I was walking up the sidewalk, and someone was walking their dog, and I thought, I won't make eye contact, I won't make eye contact, and then the dog made eye contact, and so did I, and we both melted into butter. <laughs> So with the owner just standing there saying, oh my, she's happy to see you, isn't she? <laughs> uh, but we went, we went to the Brattle and it was, it was a perfectly temperate morning. You didn't even need a coat on. I had one on, but you didn't need it. You could have shopped outside without one. Uh, and the Brattle was a, a tumult of activity as always. Lots and lots of people. Well, it turns out there was, I had plenty of time to, to chat with the staff, which is one of the main reasons that I go there is to chat with friends of mine that I've had for a long time. Uh, and you would think that, that if I was going there just to meet Mark and sort of, you know, be at the Brattle with him, that since I was just at the Brattle the other day, I wouldn't find anything. And you'd be wrong. <laughs> I guess I found a pile of books that I want to show you. Uh, uh, <laughs> We'll start off with a two-volume set from 100 years ago that, uh, that I have a whole shelf of these things. I have a whole bookcase of these things. You, this is the type of thing you get at the Brattle for, you know, a dollar a piece. That they're still in the condition that they were when they came out 150 years ago. And no one else wants them. <laughs> no one else wants them. They are clear Steve books. Uh, I found a two-volume set of the letters of John Ruskin to uh, Charles Eliot Norton, who was... Uh, an American public intellectual, a great, great Dante scholar, uh, a man of letters, a book man, a researcher, a, a, an intellectual and scholar of a of a, just a general unmoored type. He was he was connected with Harvard, and he did the North American Review, which is a, was a big uh, literary periodical at the time. But mainly, he was thought of in the general population as just uh, America's foremost intellectual, and he was thought of that way by the general population. It was a different era. It, the, there is no way to to recapture the position that Charles Eliot Norton had in his society today. The position that we that that we have today for public intellectuals is entirely occupied by charlatans. Uh, I would argue because lowering standards of of education over the the decades have led to a public that is easily montbanked by charlatans so the, so the, of course the charlatans are going to move in the public the real public intellectuals won't be there every once in a while you'll find one uh, also at harvard would be peter gomes the, the great uh, biblical scholar 
every once in a while you'll find one, but it's rare. They're usually charlatans. Uh, Charles Elliot Norton was not a charlatan, and this he was also extremely meticulous from the very beginning of his life. So he kept everything and paid it, dated everything and made copies of everything. And so uh, he had, uh, over time, amassed a huge collection of letters uh, from Ruskin. Sensing that Ruskin was an enormous name in his day, the biggest intellectual name of his time, it, was, it would have been unthinkable to Norton that, that an age would come very comparatively soon, a century, only a century. It would have been unthinkable to him that Ruskin would be unknown, unread, unquoted, unprinted. That would have been unthinkable to him, and now it's true. And he is even less known, and that would, that would have been unthinkable and also unpalatable, because he was a bit of a prickly egomaniac. <laughs> and I want to read you. I won't read you too much of this, because I realize this is a, a rarefied thing. I have to check and see. Once I'm done inventorying this thing, I will check and see uh, just how many Charles Eliot Norton books I have, collections of letters, edited things, his translations. I have a lot. I, I accidentally, just by shopping at the Brattle, I think I may have amassed a very large collection of Charles Eliot Norton. I told a friend of that of mine that years ago, and he said, well, you ought to write a biography of Charles Eliot Norton. You're in a perfect position to do so. You ought to write a biography of him. Uh, and I don't know. I don't, what would be the point of writing a biography that no one would ever publish? Uh, but that is John Ruskin. That is the uh, picture that's here in the book. But just to make sure that you don't forget him, Charles Elliot Norton also tipped in a picture of himself. <laughs> just so you don't forget. This comes from 1904. And I want to read you the beginning of this because it is pure Charles Elliot Norton. Just pure. It is with reluctance and question that I have brought myself to publish these letters. I have contemplated leaving them in such a condition that perhaps some of them might be printed after my death. In my judgment, Ruskin himself published or permitted to be published far too many of his letters. Some of them, it has seemed to me, such as should never have been printed. Sentence number two. And he's taken a hammer to the guy he reveres. Uh... In his later years, much even of what he wrote for publication could not but cause regret to every reader of sensitive appreciation as affording evidence of a weakened faculty of judgment by its lack of self-control and becoming reticence. So not only did, did Ruskin print too many of his own letters during his own lifetime, but he really wrote too much. He lost it. He really lost it towards the end there. Uh, I had no disposition to run the risk of adding to the mass of ill-advised publications which gave a false impression of a man not less remarkable for the essential beauty of his disposition than for the astonishing force and variety of his genius. But the editors of the final complete edition of Ruskin's writings, now in course of issue, were urgent with me to put them in possession of his letters to me, not only for use in their thorough and, in many respects, admirable biographical introductions to the separate works. Note, the, the biographical introductions to the separate works are not in all respects admirable, just in many respects, <laughs> but also for complete publication in one of the volumes. I recognized the force of their claim, but I didn't fork over the letters. <laughs> no, I didn't do that. Not if I can do it myself. Uh, no other series of his letters extended unbroken over so long a term of years or was likely to possess such an autobiographical interest, comparatively little indeed as a record of events, but much as a record of moods and mental conditions. At a picture of character, the letters as a whole were unique. But I was unwilling to entrust the charge of selecting and editing them to anyone, especially to one who had not known Ruskin in his better days and had not known me at all. Influenced by these considerations, I finally resolved upon the present publication. <laughs> and he mentions, he mentions at the end of his preface, I have not printed all the letters which Ruskin wrote to me, in spite of the poets, in spite of the modern usage, in spite of Ruskin's own example. I hold with those who believe that there are sanctities in love and life to be kept in privacy inviolate. <laughs> he wrote that in Cambridge, Massachusetts. This guy never had a thought that he didn't publish in Quattro. That's, that's ridiculous for him to say that. The, the gist of that is, that gives you the gist of Charles Eliot Norton, who was a feeling, very perceptive reader and translator, and a bit of a jerk. <laughs> so he's in that, he takes a swipe at Ruskin, first of all. Both professionally, he publishes too much of his stuff. And also personally, he really lost a stroke or two in his golf game. And then takes a swipe at the editors of, of Rus Ruskin's complete work. Saying, well, they don't know me. They don't know who I am. 
and their work is mostly admirable, but I'd better do this myself. <laughs> and, and he does. And this is not just the letters with little footnotes. This is, this is uh, Charles Elliot Norton really making a narrative out of these. It's not, it not I, I don't know if I can show you, I don't know if you'll be able to tell, but it's, it, it's, you get a letter, see there's one ending, then you get a huge amount of text as Norton makes a narrative out of the story. That makes it invaluable. And he's a really good writer. I don't think I want to write a biography of him, though. I really don't think I do. What would be the point? Who would read it? What would be the point? I don't have any academic standing, and I would need that in order to sell it to an agent to sell it to an academic press. I would absolutely need that. My first choice, of course, would be the Belknap Press of Harvard University Press. Absolutely. I would. It, it, uh, Norton walked by those their buildings every single day of his adult life. They would, of course, be my first choice. And the very first question they would ask, and the last question they would ask, would be, who are you affiliated with? I'm not affiliated with anybody. I'm affiliated with Frida. <laughs> I am, baby. I'm affiliated with you. I am. <laughs> <laughs> that would be all they'd want to know. Well, I'm sorry. You, you, so you're not a real scholar is what they would say. There's no way that it could happen. And even if it did happen, if I, as a miracle, the Belknap Press said, okay, well, we will we will take a biography, an 800-page biography of Charles Elliott Norton from you. We think you can make it interesting. Who would buy it? Nobody would buy it. Not even libraries would buy it. So I'm content just to read about the guy. I am fascinated with him. I think he's just fascinating. So I would gladly add these. I have a shelf of 100, 150 year old letter collections, lives in letters, that sort of thing. And they're all Bostonians of a certain vintage. And he was an Ur Bostonian of a certain vintage, a Brahmin among Brahmins, a Brahmin of the Brahmins, as uh, Rudyard Kipling called him. He was a friend of Kipling's father. And Kipling's father brought the boy <laughs> to Boston to meet Charles Eliot Norton. And Kipling was very impressed by this by this figure who was awe-inspiringly knowledgeable. I mean, Charles Eliot Norton read everything in the world. He never forgot anything that he read. He always had an app quotation right at the edge of his fingertips, thought the world was going to heck in a handbasket, wrote an eloquent line, could write an eloquent line very quickly. You might you might talk about the... Uh, he might strike a reluctant aesthetic line, but these volumes were written at white-hot speed, <laughs> as fast as any schlock novelist that he condescended to in his own day. Uh, I think he's a fascinating figure, but I don't think there's an 800-page biography in the works. <laughs> and then this next one, wee bit of an embarrassment. <laughs> this uh, is a rebuy, which would be bad enough. Occasionally, uh, a book will slip into a brattle sale pile, get to the brattle, go in boxes down into the basement, sit there for a while, then come back up in boxes, get priced, go out into the sale lot, and right back into my hands. That does happen. Jason Harrigan, in a recent video, called it a boomerang buy. Uh, uh, that's bad enough, but it's worse when you don't remember. And I grabbed this thing off the shelves thinking, ooh, and, and then saw when I opened it that it had been mine only a couple of years ago. This is a UK hardcover of The Lodger by Charles Nichol about one particular place where William Shakespeare lived. And the reason that, the thing that makes it so special is that Charles Nichol is great at, at unearthing and reading documents, fine reading documents, to really get at everything that they have to tell us. I already have an ebook of the book, but I got this a couple of years ago, and I it must have got rid of it without thinking about it, and then I got it back. So I know, baby, I know. Oh, goodness. <laughs> uh, okay, this next one uh, is a misdemeanor on Mark's part, on Dronzo's part. He insisted on giving me two books when we met. That is no better a version of violating rule number one than sending me something. That the two books that he pulled out of his bag are books that I do want, and it seemed churlish to say no, uh, so I took them both. One is a Penguin classic, The Translator's Art. This is a series of festrif. This is a series of essays uh, from Penguin translators that were done uh, in honor of Betty Raddus, who was uh, uh, the guiding force behind their translations forever and ever. So a lot of Penguin translators do essays either about translating the work they translated for Penguin or about translating just in general. And I have read this thing. I had it once upon a time. I got it from the, when the old Penguin bookstore went out of business. I think that's where I got it. Or maybe I had it at the library, at, a, at a, one of my libraries. But I've never owned a copy, and now I do, and it's right after my own heart. I absolutely love the subject of translation. Absolutely love it. 
and a lot of these the, the pieces in here I'm not sure that I remember well enough so I'm glad I will go I will go at it again I'm very grateful although handing me books in person and you'll see it's not the only time he did it he handed me two uh, but I also found this I couldn't pass it up for a dollar especially since we're, we're on the subject of Edna St. Vincent Millay yesterday I mentioned uh, Rapture and Melancholy uh, the first ever collection of her diaries and in the course of that I mentioned there's a great big uh, white trade paperback collected poems of hers that I don't have uh, and also a great biography by Nancy Milford, Savage Beauty. And when I was at the Brattle today, I saw Huntsman What Quarry, uh, a slim volume of poetry uh, from Edna St. Vincent Millay. But, uh, this was uh, mid-career. It's got lots and lots of great stuff in it that I'm not going to be able to... Look at that. There's the works of Edna St. Vincent Millay on the back there. This You could get this book. This was from Harper and Brothers when, when she was a working poet. This was $2. And it was... Uh, it was bought by someone in 1939, and it was right out there in the sale lot. So I grabbed it. I'm not above a slim volume of poetry now and again. This next one is, the, is Mark's other present. It's also slim. I, this is very, very nice, but totally unnecessary. If you go to the Brattle and we agree to meet there, you do not have to give me tribute. <laughs> not at all. This is by Ronald Sim. The great Ronald Sim. Uh, we saw him just the other day in my library tour, the author of the Roman Revolution. This is a little book of his called Some Arvel Brethren. A uh, tiny little thing, very much insider baseball for the Latinist, for, for the classicist. Uh, the Arvel Brethren were a, kind of a, a religious order, a, a very vague and very socially prominent religious order that it was it, it did you some social good to be seen to be a member of it especially since it was heavily endorsed by the emperor augustus and we have sort of attendance records and sim specialized in this sort of thing he also is a great interrogator of records and the the more arid on the surface the better and so he makes an interesting inquiry out of uh, what what any other writer would look at it and say, there's not a book here. <laughs> so, and I, some Arvel Brethren is quoted a lot. Of course, it comes up in every Sim bibliography. But I, I don't have a copy. Well, now I do. Now I have a copy with with one of these things on it, with, with a nice library cover on it. Very, very grateful. Uh, then uh, this next one, I almost broke one of the foremost rules of the Brattle. One, the, the Brattle is a... a Great used bookstore. It was bustling today. There was lots of staff, lots of customers. There's also a sale lot next door that's huge. It's thousands more books for $1, $3, and $5 out there. And they're in no order except for price. And you are not to impose order. If you One of the foremost rules of the Brattle sale cards is if you go out there looking for something, so if you turn the corner of the sale lot, you've got all these thousands of books in front of you, and you say, uh, okay, well, I want the third Harry Potter book. I'm just going to look for that. Not only will you not find the third Harry Potter book, but you won't find anything else either. You have to go with the flow of the cards. And I do, religiously. I don't go to the cards looking for anything. But today, I went, I had something specific in mind to look for. Oh, well, it wasn't for me. I was thinking maybe it would be for somebody else. And I thought maybe that wouldn't break the rules. And I did find it. <laughs> so this is, this is uh, Stanley Olson's biography of John Singer Sargent, the great, the great painter. John Singer Sargent. This is uh, <laughs> Max Beerbohm characterization of Sargent. This is a fantastic biography. Uh, this is an old sticker. I think that's from B. Dalton. I'll have to see if that will come off. Uh, I, uh, I don't have a copy of this book, so I'm happy to have it, and, and there's a chance that I will give it away, so I, I did find it. I'm hoping that I didn't break rule number one. <laughs> and then, then this next one, is something I already have. This is a double buy, but it's not an accidental one. I knew. But one of the things that I've noticed, uh, I write a column. I write a book column every week uh, for the Bedford Times Press in Iowa and also uh, the Lennox Timetable and I'm hoping other papers in Iowa. If you have a local paper that wants to run my column, let me know or let my editor know. Uh, but one of the, I used to write a column a long, long time ago and it's very different from writing a review. Uh, it's it's a very different kind of voice. It's a very different way of doing things. And one of the things that you that I'm remembering uh, that I had temporarily forgotten is that you have to constantly be thinking about your column, or you are going to reach the night before it's due with no idea what you want to write about, and that's what gives rise to so many bad columns that are out there on so many subjects. 
Instead, you have to constantly be thinking about your column, and that doesn't necessarily mean trawling the news. You have to start thinking in, you have to start training your mind, or in my case, retraining my mind, to look at something and say, that could be a column. That could be a column. It's not just bookish news. It's, it's not just that. You have to look for what opportunities the whole world presents you for a book column. And I saw something and immediately thought, that could be a column. Now, I might be wrong. I have that thought plenty of times, and there, it, I try it out, and there actually isn't a column there. But I don't know. I found a copy of Kenneth Clark's book, Civilization, for a dollar. You'll see, unlike these other books, I left this price tag on there because I'm thinking of maybe using a photograph of it. This was a huge, huge hit. Kenneth Clark's TV series, his documentary called Civilization, was an enormous culture reshaping hit. And the book companion sold everywhere, like the Dickens. Everybody who loved the TV show wanted this book. It was everywhere. It was even assigned in some schools. And here, 50, 60 years later, I found it for a dollar in a sale lot. No one's ever heard of it. No one's seen the civilization in forever and ever. The show is not is not shown again. The book has long since been superseded. No one even knows what these kinds of things are anymore. Uh, what was the last companion book to do well? Life on Earth? David Attenborough? Maybe The Civil War by Ken Burns? I thought I saw this and thought, that might be a column. Explore the book and explore the, the transitory nature of, of book phenoms. Maybe come up with other examples. So I grabbed it. In this case, knowingly. <laughs> I grabbed it knowingly. I will lovingly reread it. In fact, I will read it, reread a chunk of it tonight to see if there's a column there. Maybe not my next column. I think I know what my next column is, but maybe down the line. The perfect example, because it's not timely. It's not It's not uh, linked to current events or anything like that. Instead, it's, it's uh, you know, books being evergreen, having their moment in the sun, and then disappearing, and maybe still having lots and lots of worth. That's a perennial subject. Uh, and then the last two things that I got here in this Drunzo Brattle Hall uh, are more New Yorker cartoon collections. I found a couple of themed ones the other day. I found a couple more today. I found the New Yorker book of political cartoons, for instance. There is Eustace Tilly, and Eustace Tilly's butterfly is holding the, the uh, teleprompter copy. Uh, and this is, this is all just... Uh, uh, the thing that I like about the political cartoons is that it, it skews old. You never know. It's always a, a, a question of the editor here. But, uh, you never know whether or not they're going to skew young or old. I like it when these collections skew old. That takes the sting out of them. Uh, the subject of politics in America right now has plenty of stings in it. I, I really don't want to activate any of that. But if these are from, you know, the bulk of them from the 50s and 60s, then I can live with it. Absolutely. It would be a joy to go through it. And then the second one, the second one of these, the last books I found for today, is, I believe, another double. But I had to get it just in case. There was a tremor of doubt in my mind, so I grabbed it. Uh, this is the New Yorker book of literary cartoons. And there is Eustace Tilly examining the books in a library. And the one that is being examined has a butterfly on it. That is Eustace Tilly is, is sort of the, the mascot. Of the, of the New Yorker. And this is all the kinds of literary cartoons in here. Tons and tons of fun. Uh, <laughs> I know all of these so well. Here's a, a classic Booth cartoon. There's a guy on a porch with a, a manual typewriter surrounded by dogs of all kinds. And the caption is, write about dogs! <laughs> or this one here, ask not for whom the refrigerator hums. It hums for thee. <laughs> Because it's late at night and you want a snack. Ask not for who the refrigerator hums. It hums for thee. Uh, this probably has... There's a great uh, literary cartoon. I don't know if it'll be in this book. There's a great literary cartoon where uh, a woman is at her front door and the, the guest, the person ringing the doorbell is the Grim Reaper with a scythe and the hood and everything. And she's calling over her shoulder to her husband who's in the next room at a typewriter. And the caption is... Someone here to collect your works, dear. <laughs> I don't know if that'll be in here, but that's a hoot. Uh, uh, but this will be just enjoyable, huge amounts of fun. I don't know. Uh... <laughs> okay, this is a little dated. Uh, writer's block. <laughs> I don't know if you can make those out. But that is that is literally the block of writers. All the characters are calling out writers from the 1960s. How you doing, John? That's Updike. Good, Philip. What's with you? Hiya, Tony. Nice to see you, Avery. 
Good morning, Joan. <laughs> so what's new, Norman? <laughs> There's a little time capsule right there. Uh, I don't know if the Someone to Collect Your Works will be in here, but there is a cartoon. To wrap up, there's a cartoon that I wanted to show you, BookTube, uh, just so we all remember how things stand. Okay? I even put a bookmark in the spot. This is the cartoon right there. A pair of city slickers. She, he's got the mohair coat and the sunglasses. She's got the gigantic beehive hairdo. That is a real estate agent showing them an empty house. And as you can see, it's wall after wall of built-in bookcases that make you and me drool to look at that. But the caption is, holy cow, what kind of crazy people used to live here anyway? <laughs> and the reason I'm showing that to you, BookTube, is to remind you that that is true. That is true. <laughs> that would be the reaction of most people who saw an empty house like that. Holy cow, what kind of crazy people lived here anyway? <laughs> that's us. Okay, BookTube, I don't like it either, but that's us. <laughs> In the extreme minority and viewed as insane by the rest of the world. <laughs> so anyway, that was my Brattle book haul here. I don't know when I'll be back to the Brattle, but I had to go, you know, to, to, to have a booktube team up so we have the new yorker book of literary cartoons the new yorker book of political cartoons a one dollar copy of civilization that may yield a column uh olson's biography of john singer sergeant uh some arbor brethren by sir ronald sim huntsman what quarry a slim volume of poetry from edna st vincent Millay. we have the translator's art a penguin tribute volume. We have The Lodger by Charles Nichols, a rebuy. <laughs> and finally, The Letters of John Ruskin to uh, Charles Eliot Norton, which he meticulously saved, going all the way back to the very first letter. The very first little note that Ruskin sent around to his hotel. He saved it. Because <laughs> he knew that he would be making a volume like this somewhere down the line, or that somebody would. Uh, but anyway, that's a long video for you. This was a Brattle book haul. Um, I, it, it's a beautiful temperate day today, but a lot of weather forecasts are saying snow tomorrow. So I might not go anywhere. <laughs> I certainly won't be going to the Brattle. So I'll wrap this up for now, uh, and I will see you soon. Thank you, BookTube.